स्टार्ट करूं जी जी मैडम स्टार्ट करें मैडम अस्सलाम वालेकुम आई एम डॉक्टर लुगनारी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल सॉरी फॉर बीइंग अ लिटिल लेट सो टुडेस टॉपिक वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इज अबाउट ओवेरियन ट्यूमर सो इट्स अ बिग ह्यूज टॉपिक I think one uh, lecture will not be enough, but still we have to cover all this thing in one lecture. And I think you will be uh, doing it again and again in your uh, next semesters. So uh, let's start with the ovarian tumors. Learning objective that at the end of the session you will be able to understand the classification of ovarian tumor, the risk factors of different types of ovarian tumors. and should be able to know the clinical features and staging of ovarian tumors and in the end the management plan of various stages of cancer so ovarian tumor is second most gynecological malignancy and it is the major cause of death from gynecological cancer in uk it may arise any time at any age but the commonest age is between 30 to 60 years ovarian tumors are particularly liable to be become malignant so any tumor which is arising which is has got the signs symptoms of some difference as compared to the nine clinical features such as loss of weight and uh, history of uh, loss of appetite that always may think of malignant tumors in the early stages they are asymptomatic and painless the problem is this with the ovarian tumor they are always or most of the time they are diagnosed by, by the time they have uh, crossed the certain stages they may grow to a large size and tend to undergo mechanical complications such as torsion and perforation so sometimes the ovarian tumor may become large and it may undergo a uh, torsion and perforation so that is usually emergency Right. Regarding incidence, the lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer in general population is one point four percent. That is one in seventy. Mean age of presentation is sixty four years after menopause. More prevalent in higher income nations, that is, developed countries. Variation in incidence is with ethnicity. That is, white women have the highest incidence, fourteen per hundred thousand. Asian women have lower incidence at ten per hundred thousand. Only three percent of ovarian cancers occur in women under thirty-five years of age. That means younger girl, younger woman also present with ovarian cancers, but it accounts about three percent. Women with hereditary cancer present early with a mean age at diagnosis of fifty-four years. So hereditary cancer, herit, uh, genetic factors also play a role in ovarian cancers. Coming towards the classification of malignant ovarian tumors, you must have done from your pathology as well. It is divided into three main category: epithelial origin, which constitutes about eighty percent; sex cord stromal tumors, which constitute ten percent; germ cell tumor, ten percent. and the secondary is the metastatic so that means a tumor the primary lesion may be somewhere else but the secondary metastasis or secondary lesion may present in the ovary that is known as metastatic tumor epithelial tumors uh, may be benign malignant and borderline borderline ovarian tumors are those tumors who are well differentiated they show some features of malignancy nuclear polymorphism and cellular atypia but they do not invade the basement membrane they do spread to other abdominal pelvic structures do not recur following initial surgery and most of these borderline tumors are serous in nature Mucous borderline ovarian tumors arise from appendicitis carcinoma fluo malignant potential and are associated with pseudo mixi mixoma peritoneal that means uh, you might find on the peritoneum small small lesions all peritoneum is usually covered by small small lesions that is known as pseudo mixoma peritoneal and it is particularly associated with mucinous tumors now coming towards the serous carcinomas high grade high grade serous carcinomas 75% of all epithelial cancers are characterized 
historically by concentric links of, uh, rings of calcification, which is known as somoma bodies. So out of epithelial tumors, we have got serous tumors, we have got mucinous tumors, and they are again subdivided into the line, borderline, and the uh, malignant. Hybrid palliative serous uh, carcinoma usually present with advanced cells involving the ovary, thopping tube, and peritoneal surfaces. Data from women with Burka mutation, we'll talk about the Burka later on, who have undergone risk reducing prophylactic bilateral selfidiophytomy suggest a fallopian tube, tubal precursor lesion, which is called serous tubal intraepithelial lesion. So it has been seen that although we say that this uh, tumor comes from ovary, that some of the tumor may originate from the tropian tube. So, and they suggest that their uh, lesion is called serous tubal intraepithelial lesion, which sometimes is missed. It is also characterized by mutation in P53 insecurity cells of distant tropian tube. So again, this is the genetic, uh, uh, you can say the underlying cause is genetic. You can see the serous tumors, the picture of serous tumors. Mrs. carcinomas always remember a large, huge carcinoma or tumor is a mucinous in nature. And they are usually multi-loculated and associated with pseudo-mixoma peritoneal. See how huge is this? You can see that. These all pictures of mucinous tumors. Endometrite carcinoma associated with endometriosis in 10% of cases. That means those women who has a history of endometriosis. And later on, they develop an ovarian pathology. They are likely to have endometroid carcinoma, which tends to be well differentiated and has better survival than high-grade serous carcinomas. This is the endometroid tumor. Talking about the risk factors, the higher risk factors is found to be nulli parity. Those women who never have the children, they are at high risk of developing ovarian malignancy. The, the reason being that evolution was never, uh, they continued to have evolution and it was, there was no uh, means in pregnancy. So that is why continuous evolution may lead to some damage to the epithelium, may cause some injury to the epithelium that may later on uh, may lead to ovarian uh, malignancy. Use of intrauterine device, history of endometriosis, obesity, and cigarette smoking. Low risk, the factors which leads to a woman to at lower risk of developing ovarian cancers, very multiparity. Use of combined oral contraceptive pills decreases 55% uh, chance of having ovarian tumors. History of tubal ligation, history of self injectomy, that means removal of the tube, and history of hysterectomy, that is removal of uterus. So they are considered to be at lower risk of developing ovarian cancer. Coming towards the genetic factors, 10 to 15% of women with epithelial ovarian cancer have heredity predisposition. Women with mutation in BRCA1, BRCA2, and Lynn syndrome have increased lifetime risk. Now, how would we know that? So this is actually a test which has to be carried out in those girls who have a family history, a strong family history of ovarian cancer in their mother or their immediate relatives, such as sister, maybe auntie. So the risk rises to 1 in 20 if a woman have one family member affected by defect in one of these genes. So this, these uh, Barka and Barka uh, genes, they are not available in Pakistan, maybe at Aga Khan, but I'm not sure. So we, we have not done any uh, of these genetic factors testing on our patient, but maybe available at Aga Khan University. If first one member has got, uh, is affected by these genes, so there's one in 20% chance, that is 5%. And the risk will increase to 40 to 50 percent. See how much is increased in the risk if two first degree relatives are affected by this. Hereditary cancers usually occur 10 years before the sporadic cancers and may be associated with other cancers as well. 
So if you think that means sporadic cancer for women has no hereditary or genetic factors and she has uh, she develops cancer at the age of 55 or 60. So these cancers who have genetic in origin, they may arise every 50 years at the age of 50 or 10 years before that cancer. Most common hereditary cancer is the breast ovarian cancer syndrome, which is known as BRCA. Breast ovarian cancer syndrome. 90% of the syndrome is due to mutation of tumor suppressor gene BRCA1, 80%, and BRCA2, 15%. Lynch syndrome is hereditary non polypoiesis colorectal carcinoma and associated with endometrial cancer and 10% lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. I think you must have done these type of uh, hereditary cancers in other cancers as well, such as in uh, breast cancers and in colorectal cancers. So those women who has colorectal cancer, they may be associated with endometrial cancer and risk of ovarian cancer. Now, how would you prevent ovarian cancer? This many times you find a patient who comes to you and asks the counseling and ask you that my mother had been had died because of ovarian cancer, or my auntie died because of ovarian cancer, or one of my sister has been affected by ovarian cancer. Doctor, what is my risk of developing cancer, and what should I do to prevent ovarian cancer for developing an uh, ovarian cancer? So again, we can talk about the genetic factors, the BRCA1 and BRCA2, that is available. She should go undergo these testing. And those women who comes out to be test positive with BRCA mutation, they should be offered risk-reducing prophylactic bilateral salpingeophorectomy once the family is complete. So I said bilateral salpingeophorectomy. Not only the removal of the ovary, the removal of the tubes, blocking tubes is also important because in one of the studies, it has been seen that who had the woman who had undergone ophorectomy because of the because of the family history. The ovarian cancer and later on they develop cancer in the peritoneal surfaces in the fallopian tube. So whenever you are going to do a ophrectomy, you have to remove the tubes as well. So these women, if they are younger one, they they should be offered uh, contraceptive in the form of oral contraceptive pills. And as soon as they uh, they uh, means the family is complete, you can offer bilateral sandwich of Prophylactic surgery reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by 90% and pre perimenopausal breast cancer by 50%. Sign symptoms of ovarian cancer. Always remember there is no specific screening test for ovarian cancer. And usually sign symptoms may not be present in early stages and then or, or they may be present in a you can say very septal, that means a mild type of uh, symptoms may present, which mean you may not think of the ovarian malignancy. The symptoms may include rotting, abdominal or pelvic pain, difficulty in eating, or maybe increased urination, urinary symptoms. So any woman who comes to you for, with the vague symptoms, better take a proper history, take a history of cancer in the family, take a history of cancer in the immediate family members, and you can have an ultrasound done. It's sort of it's it's available very commonly. Other findings includes a pelvic mass. When you find a mass, you find ascites, when you find fluid in the abdominal cavity, so that is already in advanced case. So back backache, constipation, tiredness, non-specific symptoms, or sometimes abnormal vaginal bleeding, or history of weight loss may be present. So all these symptoms, you should always think of or try to do some investigations or think in your mind maybe she is having some sort of malignancy. So if you can go for certain investigation, it will not do any harm. Ovarian cancer is associated with, is associated with increasing age, family history of ovarian cancer, anemia, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, rectal bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, loss of appetite, and weight loss. Always weight loss and loss of appetite whenever a patient presents with these findings. Always think of going for certain investigation. Always try to find out the cause. What is the cause? Maybe it is TB. You never know. TB is still common in our setup. So you can go for TB or maybe sometimes they have got some other factors which is not apparent 
uh, on the in, on the even on ultrasound. So how would you make the diagnosis and what sort of investigations you will carry out when you suspect that the woman may be having some ovarian pathology? Transvaginal ultrasound is the best modality. The initial modality is the transvaginal ultrasound. We have ultrasound, transabdominal, and transvaginal. But for the pelvic visitors, transvaginal ultrasound is the best modality. It gives a closer view and it gives you better a uh, uh, better view of the pelvic organs. CA-125 is a tumor marker or it is a blood test. It is not specific, in, uh, but in over 80% of the ovarian cancer, it may, present, it may be present in other conditions such as endometriosis, it may be present in colon cancers, it may be present even, it may be increased in pregnancy. So it is non-specific, but still we go for CA-125, it gives us some clue of uh, cancer and later on after the treatment, we can also see the uh, prognosis of the, of the patient by doing CF125. There's a thing just known as risk of malignancy index of RM. RMI. So when a woman present with an ovarian mass, you have to calculate her RMI by menopausal status, by pelvic ultrasound features and C125 level. So, pelvic ultrasound features may tell you it's a tumor, how solid in consistency, or it has got some projections, or it is multiloculated, or it is associated along with the ascites, it is bilateral. So, some of the features may click you that this is going towards the malignancy. So, whenever you have some suspicion of malignancy, you know, when you have suspicion, you always start with the history. History may give you some points, such as loss of weight, loss of appetite, and abdominal distension within two or three months, very short history. And along with that, examination will tell you, sometimes you might find a mass, or sometimes you might find a ascites, the fluid in the abdominal cavity. So that can also alert you that this is a, some sort of malignancy. And then of course, the CT scan is the best assessment of extra disease and stage so CT scan controls should be carried out where you suspect a malignancy or ovarian pathology. Tumor markers, CA-125 is usually for the serous borderline tumors. CA-19, useless borderline tumors, in event for granulosa cell tumors. HCG is done for dysgeminoma and choriocarcinoma. Alpha fetoprotein is done for the teratomas and abdominal deep cell tumors. We'll talk about these tumors later on. The FIGO, the Federation of International Tiny and Ops in American Joint Committee on Cancers have designated a staging program. Staging is always done in all cancers, ovarian cancer, cervical cancers, vulval cancers, endometrial cancers. So staging has to be done because according to the staging, we will decide the mode of treatment. So stage one ovarian cancer, is limited to the ovaries, 1A limited to one ovary, the capsule intact, no invasion, no malignant cell in ascites or peritoneal washing. 1B tumor limited to both ovaries, capsules intact, no tumor on ovarian surface, no malignant cell in ascites. Stage 1C tumor is limited to one or both ovaries with any of the following ruptured capsule, tumor on the ovarian surface, malignant cell in ascites or peritoneal. Washing. So stage one has been divided into A, B, and C. Stage two, tumor involves one or both ovaries with pelvic extensions. Now, either one ovary is there, the capsule has been ruptured, and along with that, the tumor has extended to the pelvic organs. So again, it is divided into A, B, and C. A extension or implants of the uterus or frothing tube but no malignant cell in ascites. 2B, extension and plant of other pelvic tissues, but no malignant cell in the peritoneal washing. C, pelvic extension in plants with malignant cells in ascites or peritoneal washing. Stage three tumors will involve either one or both ovaries with microscopically confirmed peritoneal implants outside the pelvis. Superficial liver mats also equals the stage three. Stage three, again, 
microscopic peritoneal metastasis, that means when you take do the mentectomy or you take a part of the uh, peritoneum for the biopsy, you will find it on microscopic, not microscopic. That means you will not be able to find a gross appearance. B will be gross appearance, microscopic peritoneal metastasis or deposits beyond pelvis, but less than two centimeter. C, peritoneal metastasis beyond pelvis, greater than two centimeter in dimension along with the regional load, load metastasis. So this will be evident from the CT scan. The metastasis, the involvement of lymph nodes, the involvement of the uh, peritoneum will be evident on CT scan. Stage four, always think whenever you talk about the stage four of cancers, it means it is not, it has spread to distant uh, areas. That means distant metastasis will be found Parenchymal level metastasis will be equal to stage four. Now uh, we'll talk about the germ cells tumors. The first one, the epithelial tumors, which included the uh, mainly the uh, cirrus and the mesus and the endometrium. Now we'll talk about the germ cells tumors. The number two category. The germ cells tumors mainly occur in young women and covers ten percent of ovarian tumors derived from primordial germ cells, most common presenting, presenting symptom is pelvic mass. And usually a young girl, a young woman may be presenting with the pelvic mass. Or sometimes they may present with torsion or hemorrhage that there's a severe pain in the lower abdomen and when you do ultrasound, you find that there's a cyst or there's a tumor which has ruptured or which has gone undergone torsion. And most of these germ cells tumor, when they present, they are in early stage. Spread is via lymphatics or blood borne. So this germinoma is the most common of all these germ cells tumors. The germ cells tumors uh, include this germinoma, adrenal sinus tumor, and the uh, immature teratomas. So 50% of all germ cells tumors, they are this germinomas. Whenever a young girl like a girl of 16 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old, they present with ovarian malignancies, or we think it may be a malignant tumor or may, or may not be malignant, it may be borderline. So we always have in our mind that this, this is germ cell tumor. After, remember, epithelial tumors, they usually present in the later age, in the perimenopausal or postmenopausal age. So 50% of all germ cell tumors are dysgerminoma, they are bilateral in 20% of cases secrete HCG, so you, the tumor marker here will be HCG. Number two is endodermal sinus tumor, second most common germ cell tumor, 50%, 15% of total, and rarely bilateral. Secrete alpha fetal protein and usually present largely with torsion or rupture. And usually in cases of endodermal sinus tumor, the spread is late in Number third category is immature teratomas, 15 to 20% of malignant germ cells tumor, 1% of all teratomas. The benign component, if you remember, is a tumoid cyst. The teratomas can be benign or malignant. Benign is mature teratoma, and malignant is the immature teratoma. One third of this may secrete alpha P2 protein. There may be malignant transformation of a cell type within a mature teratoma. Again, the clinical features suspect if a young woman present with a large solid brain mass, you can think of the ovarian malignancy. Now, the treatment, I'm talking about the treatment of the germ cells. It depends on the age wishes to preserve fertility. You know, these patients are usually young girls, young women, or they got married just one year back or two years back, they present with these uh, tumors. If young a patient. So it's the most important thing once you made the diagnosis of a tumor or you think it may be benign or malignant, the counseling of the family is very important. You have to tell them that this is our diagnosis, but the confirmation will be made on the uh, after the surgery, after the histopathology report. And if it comes out to be malignant, then uh, of course, the clearance, the pelvic clearance, or the removal of the other ovary will be required. Again, if so pathology shows borderline, then you can think of waiting for some time. But if the histopathology confirms the malignancy, then you have to 
either reopen her again or one thing is at the time of surgery if you have facility of frozen section technique it's not available so commonly maybe our fund has it sometimes we also get it from SIUT we request SIUT people to get the frozen section technique that means when you're operating at the same time the pathologist will take a section and under microscope we see the nature of the tumor it comes out to be malignant so at the same time you can decide for the uh, surgery for the debulking surgery so it's not so commonly uh, available so that is why we for the young patients we counsel them we do the surgery after the report we can think of the second surgery we have many patients like this i remember in my uh, residency one of the patient although uh, she was not giving any sign symptoms of malignancy there was no history of weight loss or no history of loss of appetite and when i uh, removed her tumor it, one of the ovary was occupied by a tumor but it consisted it was hard in nature and uh, there was some projection as well so only uh, salpingo fertility was done that is removal of the ovary was done along with the tumor other ovary was normal looking there was no metastasis there was no, no fluid so when uh, histopathology came out, it came out to be cancer, it is geminoma. But later on, we convinced them to get uh, surgery done to remove the other ovary. But they refused. They said, my, my girl, my daughter is so young. How can you remove her uterus and ovary? How can you do this type of surgery? She needs to get married as well. And they totally refused. They were not convinced with us. So after a year, I think after a year, one and a half year, they come back. The patient was with full known metastasis, the cytic fluid, the involvement of other ovary. She was in stage four carcinoma. See, so at that time, it was not possible for us to go into the surgery. So then she was sent for chemotherapy. But later on, she didn't survive. So the, sometimes in the younger patient, the decision is very difficult for us to declare the uh, diagnosis for us to tell them what is going to be happen later on. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. So if a young woman is there and they want to preserve their fertility, the initial surgery will be unilateral salpingofectomy. Older group, if suppose the woman she present with 38 years of age, she has completed her family, full surgical staging is recommended. Convince them that they should have full staging surgery. Gyrosa cell tumors, we'll talk about it later on. These are the functional tumors. They can reoccur in long-term follow-up is required. Surgery is the main state, state of treatment and no effective chemotherapy regime is available. In cases of metastasis disease, debulking surgery is done. Intraoperative frozen section technique, I just told you, may be required. Post-operative chemotherapy will depend upon the stage of the disease. Like stage one dysgenoma or low grade teratoma is treated by surgery or not. For patients with metastatic disease, chemotherapy is given. Most common chemotherapy in cases of germ cells tumor is B, that is bleomycin, atoposide, and cisplatin, which is given as a course of three to four cycles, three hours, three weeks apart. So, this will be the decision of the oncologist. This is not our decision when to give and how to give and how many cycles has to be given. The chemotherapy. There's 90% cure rate and preserves fertility if required. Sex cord tumors are the hormone producing tumor, that is the gyrosa cell tumor, 10% of ovarian tumors, 90% of all functional, that means they do produce some hormones. The tumors are of low malignant potential with a good long term prognosis. Gyrosa, thicka, sardoli cells secrete estrogen resulting in precautious puberty, abnormal menstrual bleeding, and high risk of elemental carcinoma. So, although the age of these tumors are a little uh, late, but few of them may occur as juvenile tumors under the age of 10 years, that is a gyrosa cell tumor. That means before the actual age of minority, sometimes the girl may start having periods that is known as precautious puberty. So a woman or a girl coming to you with a history of periods at the age of eight years, or at the age of seven years, or nine years, 
that is known as precautious puberty, always think of ovarian malignancy or ovarian tumor. Abnormal nasal bleeding is another uh, symptoms. And sardonial eric tumors, the secret androgens, which may lead to paralyzation, deepening of voice, amenorrhea. The peak incidence is around the age of menopause. So you might find a woman coming to you because suddenly she noticed that her voice has changed and she is not having periods since long. And even she finds that increased growth of ears on the lips, on the chin, and all over the body like a man. So always think that there may be some uh, increased androgen secretion and think of ovarian tumor as well. So the treatment depends on the age of the patient as most of these patients are of reproductive age. Again, fertility sparing treatment may be preferred. Exploratory laparotomy done to remove the tumor. Assess the confidentiality spread to other ovary. And if cyst present in the ovary, try to remove it. Inspection of abdominal cavity, peritoneus, biopsy, and sampling are enlarged and process done. Now the management, as a whole, the management of the uh, ovarian tumors or epithelial tumors particularly. Germ cells tumors management I've done separately, right? Because these occurs in the younger age group, so they want fertility preserving uh, surgery. But epithelial tumors occur in the later age group where most of the time the family is already completed or by the time they present to you, they're already advanced age. So surgery remains necessary for the diagnosis, staging, and treatment of epithelial ovarian cancer. We also have one patient in our ward with stage 4 carcinoma with uh, huge uh, abdominal distension and ascites. So I'm going to do a staging report on Saturday. So I don't think so I will be able to do the debulking surgery, but I will try to take out the bulk. But this is basically performed by dining oncology. And uh, sorry to say, we don't have these type of gynae oncologists available everywhere. So subspecialty has, uh, this is one of the subspecialty of the gynae. And Ahan has got it, but everybody can't afford to go to Ahan. Yaka National Hospital has got a gynae oncologist. So everybody can't afford to go there. So I mean, I will just open her take her peritoneal sampling of the scientific fluid washing and do the uh, histopathology, take sample for histopathology, stage the disease. And then of course she will be requiring chemotherapy because the oncologist also required a confirmation by biopsy. Just only on MRI or CT scan, they will never start with chemotherapy. So objective of surgery is to stage accurately the disease and remove all visible tumors. Vertical incision is given because you might need a help of a surgeon as well. You might need uh, to see the abdominal uh, other distress like liver, sometimes feet. Peritoneal washing has to be taken in a, a syringe. That is heparinized syringe. You have to take the peritoneal washing. Total abdominal strictly along with partial omentectomy has to be done. That is, a part of momentum is taken. Check momentum for metastasis, so that should be done. The lymph node resection is important, especially in early stage disease. The lymph nodes, especially those paraiotic lymph nodes, um, lymph nodes which are in the vicinity of genital lymph nodes, that should also be uh, removed. The treatment options of ovarian cancer is based on the stage of the disease at which the patient present, which is the reflection of the extent or spread of the cancer to other parts of the body. If as a patient, she presents with late stage, so again, the treatment will depend upon her uh, fitness, anesthesia fitness. If a patient is not fit for the surgery, you can send her for chemotherapy and later on after chemotherapy, sometimes the, uh, <clears throat> the tumor may shrink and then you can go for the surgery. It also depends on um, the historical cell type, the patient's age and overall condition. But basically, there are two forms of treatment for women cancer surgery and the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is the primary treatment or may, may, may act as a primary treatment or may act as an adjuvant treatment following surgery. So I just told you, just if a patient is unfit for the surgery, 
So we can send her for chemotherapy as a primary treatment. And after the chemotherapy, if you find that there is a, uh, there is a uh, uh, response to the chemotherapy and the tumor is shrink, then you can think of the interval debulking surgery, then you can open her up, you can uh, remove the tissues or remove the bulk of the tumor as much as possible. Because if you remove the tumor, uh, uh, most of the tumor is removed, the response to the chemotherapy will be better. The survival rate will be better. So those women who can undergo surgery in the early stage, they can uh, be sent up after the surgery for the chemotherapy. The most popular chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is a combination of platinum uh, compound, which is known as carboplatin with bacutexin. Usually six cycles are given three weeks apart. Again, this is the domain of the oncologist. This is their duty to decide according to the histopathology uh, to, and according to the staging of the tumor, which type of chemotherapy will be best for which patient. All these chemotherapeutic agents will have side effects. They will lead to neutropenia, they will lead to uh, loss of uh, body uh, and vacutexel is associated with total body hair loss. The patient may have GIT symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So these symptoms when they are these patients are sent to oncology department, they usually they are explained about the side effects of this tumor, the follow-up of the uh, patient, and how to give these drugs. This is all explained of the small counsel to the patient. So this is an important part of the treatment. Now again, if I come back to these tumors, the depending upon the staging of the tumor, depending upon which stage the patient has presented, the prognosis will depend. So we can't predict prognosis of every patient. This will depend upon the age of presentation, at which stage she has presented, what is the age of the patient. You know, staging of the tumor, age of presentation, the volume of the tumor, all these matters, they all affect the prognosis of a patient. As the ovarian tumors, they remain undiagnosed until they are large or readily spread to pelvis. So many patients, they are diagnosed with tumor, no longer confined to the ovary. That means they are already in the uh, metastatic uh, condition. So how can we say about the pregnancy? So with the staging, always remember stage 4 disease will the prognosis or survival rate will be almost 15 to 20 percent. So if the patient has come in the early stage, but definitely the survival of the prognosis will be better, especially for the um, germ cells tumors. But for the epithelial tumors, the prognosis will be little bad as compared to these. So again, if somebody is very keen or someone is very much uh, anxious that she has in her family the ovarian tumor, the history of ovarian tumor, then she should have a proper checkup with the doctor every year because we don't have any particular screening tests which can pick up early ovarian cancer, like in the breast cancer, we have the mammogram which can pick up the early uh, changes of cancer, like in the CSR, which the pap smear may tell you. But in the ovarian cancer, we don't have any. Uh, screening test which can tell us the only thing what we can do we can do biomedical examination transvaginal ultrasound to see the early changes in the ovary and the CA125. CA125 is again non-specific but those who have brought the families to ovary cancer they can have their blood count one and blood count two testing done and again once they have finished their family they've completed their family they should undergo the prophylactics Again, there are many uh, houses who will not uh, be agreed by this. And for the participants, uh, tell them to take OCPs because we just did that OCP also decreased the risk of ovarian cancer. So, poor 5 to 10 years survival rate as compared to other female cancer. C125 is a high molecular weight lack of protein, which is present in 80% of the serous endometrial carcinomas. Long term contraceptive may use the risk to half. Tubular ligation reduces risk and may be effective for BARTA 
positive patient as well. So very difficult to decide about it. These are the uh, different stages. But I think your book says more about it. And uh, this uh, lecture was taken reference a reference uh, from the 10 teachers, very nicely written, very good written. Please do read 10 teacher. I have taken all this from the 10 teacher of Dining Arts, the dissertation. So thank you very much. Um, I know the tumors are a little boring, tumors are a little long, but sometimes you might get confused in it. So, but we have to do it. So hope you understood all the uh, things which I explained you. So thank you very much. So I would like to take questions. Questions? Intrauterine uh, device is also a contraception. Are you see the intrauterine contraceptive device is also causing a contraception? So it has been found that it, it does not uh, uh, means you want to see why it is and it causes increase in increased risk of the because it does not uh, inhibit the ovulation. Huh? COC inhibits the ovulation. So whoever is inhibiting the ovulation or a patient is having pregnancies, so ovulation is uh, inhibited for that particular period because ovulation is a trigger sign. You say ovulation triggers something, disrupt the epithelium, which may lead to ovarian uh, malignancy. So intrauterine contraceptive this does cause contraception, but it, the mode of action is different. It does not allow the implantation or it thickens the cervical mucus, it does not inhibit the ovulation. So it may be a factor for increased risk of uh, developing ovarian cancer. Then, uh, which, which slides you want me to uh, repeat better? Long-term contraception means uh, contraception with COCs. Those who have put a family history of ovarian cancer, they have to they are advised to take COCs. Long-term contraception, if the woman is nulliparous, look at the risk factor. The risk factor is nulliparous, that means she never conceived. A woman who has got multiple pregnancies, they are at lower risk. I don't say no risk, at the lower risk of developing ovarian cancer. Remember, multiparity has increased risk of developing C cervix, but lower risk of ovarian cancer. So it doesn't mean long-term contraception is required. But if a woman has got the family history of ovarian cancer, she should use combined oral contraceptive as a contraception. So yes, ideally ovarian tumors, there should be some, you know, all the malignancies should have a superpathology report before uh, the treatment. Uh, but before removal, what do you mean by before ovarian tumor? When you suspect an ovarian tumor, you have to open the patient, you have to do the, try to remove the uh, tumor as much as possible. If it is inoperable, you can take the biopsy. So as to confirm the staging and to confirm the histopathology report. First three, it is all written, the slides I've made all from 10 teacher. It's not that difficult. You can go back to 10 teacher. The same is written there. I've they done all my from 10 teacher. I haven't taken out from some postgraduate book because I know ovarian cancer is a little bit uh, difficult. So I try to make, make it simple. I try to make it simple so that you can at least have some idea of the classification, what is the age of the tumor, different type of tumors. I hope all of you understood. Anything else, Peter? We have in our board a patient with a variant malignancy, stage four. Uh, I think she's menopausal and huge abdomen with the scientists. 
loss of weight, loss of appetite. So we have to confirm the diagnosis by taking out the histopathology and later on she will be sent for the chemotherapy. In some cases, palliative treatment is also required, like if the patient is presenting in stage four and she's inoperable. I, I'm trying to take her fitness. Most probably she'll be fit for the surgery, but we have to explain that, that she may die on table, she may die later on. But if it is inoperable, then the only thing is, or she cannot tolerate chemotherapy, so sometimes palliative treatment is good. Palliative means whatever her symptoms, you just get the treatment of that symptom. If she has pain, you can give her painkiller. If she cannot take anything by mouth, you can give her parental, by parental way. This is the palliative treatment. And always remember if the ovaries, the cancer, re recurrent cancer will always be treated by chemotherapy. It is very difficult for us to do it. One thing is known as uh, secondary loop uh, leprotomy. That means in few cases, some cases, after the chemotherapy, we find there's a good response to chemotherapy. We again do leprotomy to see how much tumor has shrink. That is known as second loop leprotomy. We, we are not doing like that. I never find uh, that we have done this and I, neither we are doing this because this may be done in uh, developed countries, but not for us. Which treatment is effective? The treat most treatment which is effective for the ovarian territory. Whenever you talk about cancer surgery, the, in the initial stage surgery, because you need to remove the bulk of the ovarian mass, then, then an only chemotherapy will act. Otherwise, it not, will not be possible. But in few cases, oncologists, they will always say, the doctor first will send us to us, we'll give them some chemotherapy, it will reduce the mass, and then you carry out your surgery. So it's better whenever you think of an ovarian cancer, you have a patient with ovarian cancer that to be discussed with the multidisciplinary team, which will involve the surgeon, the on gynae oncologist, I'm saying gynae oncologist, and the oncologist, and the uh, review therapist or whoever is responsible for giving the chemotherapy. Any other questions? Okay. जी मैडम जी मैडम कोई वो मैंने चैट बॉक्स खोला हुआ है क्वेश्चन अभी तक कोई भी नहीं आया अच्छा चलिए दो मिनट देख लेते जी मैडम जी क्वेश्चंस देना तो वैसे फिनिश है ओके मैडम ओके